And today we have a subject that I personally have always been fascinated with. And maybe you've wondered the same thing. If, if God knows everything, why pray? If God knows how everything's gonna turn out, if he's got everything all lined up, why pray? Well, I, I want us to tackle this in two logical parts. Part one, if God knows everything. Well, according to scripture, God does know everything. The $20 word for that is that God is omniscient. That God is omniscient, that it is an attribute of God and here's a pretty solid definition of that attribute. God has perfect, immediate knowledge of all things past, present, and future. God has perfect, immediate knowledge of all things past, present, and future, like my mom did. <laughs> she really didn't, but she liked me to think she did. And once I became a parent, it became obvious to me that there was great power in knowledge. But because I was not actually God, I had to put together a network of spies who would feed me information about my children. I happen to see a couple of them here today, as a matter of fact, it's very effective. I get a call, uh, hey, Avery left his jacket on the playground I just dropped it off at your back door. So you see, now I have knowledge that Avery does not have. That's fake omniscience. I not only know that he left his jacket somewhere for the 50th time, but I also know where he left it and the coup d'etat, I have the jacket. And so when he gets home a couple hours later, I can ask this question and already fully know the answer. So, where's your jacket? <laughs> now, an evil person, an evil person would let him break down in tears, and then that evil person would make him get on his bike and go and look for the jacket <laughs> that I already have. But I wasn't real great at this. Because I, I, I would feel bad when I saw his sweet face get all ashen and his head drop. But it, it, it was always kind of magic when I'd pull the jacket out from behind my back. So that's fake omniscience. Or if my daughter Lindsay was somewhere she wasn't supposed to be and a spy in our network informed me, we'd go, we'd show up. <laughs> that's fake omniscience. Of course, my favorite, when Tommy rolled through a four-way stop uh, and before he had gone two blocks, someone had called me and told me. So I called him. Son, come to a complete stop at Yates and Shady Grove. <laughs> he said, Dad, how did you? Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. By the way, dads, on this weekend, only four weeks from Father's Day, all of these events with my children, this is how legends are made, if you're interested. <laughs> now, we all know that I've been talking, uh, what I've been talking about is very much fake omniscience. I said as much. Here's the real deal. You ready? Second Chronicles 16, nine. For the eyes of the Lord reign throughout the earth, to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Psalm 147.4, he determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Hebrews 4.13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. See, that's the real deal. A God whose eyes range throughout the earth, a God who numbers and names the stars, that is total knowledge, that is card-carrying omniscience. So God does know everything. Secondly, God is way bigger than we can comprehend. One of the eternal truths of the faith is that we are made in the image of God. We probably need to talk about all the ramifications of that one weekend. It's a fascinating discussion. 
But on this point of omniscience, while we are in fact made in the image of God, God is dramatically way down the road from us when it comes to knowledge. However we imagine his ability to, under, to know all, we undershoot it every time. Micah 4, 12 says this, but they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. They do not understand his plan. I'm a little predictable to my cats. They probably anticipate what I might do on occasion, but they really have no idea what I'm thinking, do they? They really don't know my plans for the day. They don't know my pin number. I'm not sure I know it, to be honest with you. <laughs> We're a little bit like the cats in that regard. God's knowledge is way bigger than what we can comprehend. Now, that doesn't mean we don't try, though. Some of us try real hard to figure God out. And if we get really ambitious, we figure out a way to tie God up, all neat and tidy. We box him up so we can explain him. And so we can keep an eye on him. And frankly, in my opinion, when we do that, God with a capital G becomes God with a lowercase g. We lessen them. So, so God knows everything. God is way bigger than we can comprehend. Third reflection is this. God is never surprised. God is never surprised. Tsunamis, American Idol, <laughs> pandemics may surprise us. God is never surprised. When the pandemic raged, God didn't say, Oh man, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> Remember our definition? God has perfect, immediate knowledge of all things past, present, and future. And all of that is an interesting intellectual exercise until the tsunami hits us or the pandemic takes the life of someone we love. Then it's not so interesting that God knows everything it's troubling that God didn't stop that one thing. Okay, we're not gonna open up that can of worms today because today we're talking about what God knows, not what God allows. But I will say this, so it doesn't look like I'm dodging the issue. The bad things in this world are really about a broken and fallen world, not about some cruel God. Put a pin in that, and we'll talk about that at another time. Here's one of the great things about God never being surprised. When we are surprised by events in our lives, especially loss, God can be a great source of peace. You ever been in a frantic situation and everybody's going crazy? What a comfort it is to have someone walk into that room who brings peace and brings clarity God is like that. God doesn't freak out like we freak out. Why? Because he's never surprised. And that's a good thing. That's a comforting thing. One more, if God knows everything, reflection. Years ago, I found myself engaged in a conversation with my late father-in-law about the vastness of the universe. He was a brilliant engineer. And we were on the roof of the Madison Hotel. And he was talking about how our planet is but a dot in the vastness of one particular galaxy. And that how our, our galaxy is but a dot in the vastness of a universe that holds galaxy after galaxy after galaxy. Whenever conversations move in that direction, I'm immediately reminded of two things. First, I'm, rem I'm, I'm reminded that God is absolutely magnificent. And secondly, I always begin to think about how small I am in the whole economy of things. Here's some good news. We say that God knows everything. Well, our fourth reflection is this. Part of what God knows is you. You are not so insignificant that God doesn't know you. And your confusion 
you may say, no one understands me. God does. In your frustration, you say, no one can feel what I'm feeling. God can. In your pain, you say, you have no idea what I went through as a child. God knows. In desperation, you say, I'm terrified about tomorrow. Listen, God's seen tomorrow already. In fact, he's, he's there waiting for you in your tomorrow. Psalm 44, 21 says, he knows the secrets of the heart. Jesus says in Luke 16, he said to them, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. You know, this, this whole concept of a, of a personal God sets the Christian faith apart. God is not some distant other. God did not wind up some cosmic clock and he's just sitting in heaven watching it wind down. God is aware of us. God is aware of us as individuals. And so four thoughts. God does know everything. God is way bigger than what we can comprehend. God is never surprised. And part of what God knows is you. So here's the second part of the question. Why pray? It's a great question. If God knows everything, why pray? You know, when you think of faith, when you think of the disciplines that surround a life of faith, the idea of prayer is always part of the equation, right? Rest assured that in every church today, across the globe, a prayer will be offered. Some will be very simple, some complex, some will be extemporaneous, some will be written, some will be modern, some will be ancient, some will be done in a whisper, some will be done in a shout. So what is prayer? Well, duh, it's talking to God. Actually, that, that, that's a pretty good answer. We may even decide that that's the best answer. But, but I, I, I got a few definitions of prayer that I dug up in my research over the last couple of weeks. Here's one I found. Prayer is a reverent petition made to God, a God, or another object of worship, okay? Prayer is a personal communication with God, talking and listening to him. Here's the third one. The true meaning of prayer is to use one's life force in the most positive way for the betterment of one's personal life as well as the world. I'm not real sure what that means but it does mean something to some. Here's another. Prayer is the soul's sincere desire, uttered or unexpressed. That's interesting. Here's the last one. Prayer is a primitive act done by people who depend on a non-existent deity to solve their problems. Any of those ring true with you? I, I still like that very simple definition of prayer as being talking to God. But I do think that for the most of us, when we define prayer as talking to God in our mind, it's, it's a pretty narrow answer. We, we bow our heads and close our eyes and talk, which is all good, absolutely all good. In fact, that's mainly, that's mainly the way I pray. But is it the only way to pray? No, it's not the only way. To, I, I pray when I run, too, and when I drive. Not great places for bowed heads and closed eyes, I might say. But back to our why for the day, in light of God's omniscience, why pray? Here's the first thing that jumps to my mind. Why pray? Well, we are instructed to. We are instructed to. Scripture is pretty clear about it. Jesus is very clear about it. Not only does he give us the model, you may recall, in the Lord's Prayer, but, but he says things like this. This is Matthew 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, prays, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? 
And Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. And Paul, again in Philippians, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. And again in Colossians, Paul again says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. I've never been able to put prayer on the shelf because God seems so clear about it in his word. Plus, we follow the example of Jesus. See, Jesus was a man of prayer. John 17, one, this great chapter on the prayer of Jesus. Jesus spoke these things and raising his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. When I was a teenager, and began to just fully understand that Jesus was God. I went down this rabbit trail on Jesus and prayer. It went something like this. Okay, so if Jesus is God, when he prays, is he really just talking to himself? I know that's weird, but I was a weird teenager, apparently. <laughs> Why else would we pray? Well, I think we need to see it for what it is. It is a privilege Prayer is a privilege. Think about that for a moment. We have the singular privilege of speaking with the very creator of the universe. It's amazing. The author of Hebrews writes, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. So he says, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. One more thought. Prayer affects our lives. Prayer affects our lives. James 1.5 says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach and it will be given to him. 1 Peter 5, 7, this is Patty's mom's favorite verse. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And then James says this beautifully in James 5. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they've sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And, and let me, by the way, make sure we're all on the same page with the, with the content of prayer. Asking for something should just be a, an element of prayer. Prayer is way more than that. Last year we did a sermon on prayer and, and we divided prayer up into four distinct sections. You remember that? The acronym for it was ACTS, A-C-T-S. A was adoration. We adore God for who he is in our prayer. C was confession. We confess our shortcomings before God. T was thanksgiving. We have much to be thankful for. And S was supplication. That's the ask. Let me leave you with this thought, though. I, I've come to believe that ultimately the most significant purpose of prayer is the pursuit of being in the presence of God, the God who knows everything. See, that's where it kind of comes together for me. The reality that God does know everything and that we can enter into his presence by speaking with him. Psalm 27, four is a beautiful passage. This one thing have I asked of the Lord that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Listen, I don't fully understand how God can know everything and yet my prayers can change things. I don't get it. I just believe that both can be true 
at the same time. And, and that, my friends, is part of the mystery and the wonder of faith. And let me say this too. I know a bunch of y'all. And I know many of you good, strong, faith-centered people have prayed earnestly for something. Generally, it is often someone who is ill and you have prayed fervently and you've asked others to pray with you and you have prayed with a believing heart and it was not part of God's plan. And that is tough. Especially when you read verses like we've read today and so I don't understand that fully. Here's what I do believe. I believe that when I don't fully understand the mind of God, I must trust the heart of God. And his heart is good. So let's say a quick prayer to the God who already knows what I'm getting ready to say, okay? Let's pray together. Father, we are humbled by your strength and your power and your grace in our lives. We are humbled that you call us your friend. We are humbled to know the very God creator who hung the stars in place and who gives us our very breath. Father, I think we may be most humbled by the fact that we can talk to you, that we can pour our heart out to you, that we can plead with you, for that is the sort of God you are. And we thank you and we love you. And we need you. In the strong name of Jesus, amen. Thanks for joining us today. We love to pray for you and celebrate alongside you. Please share anything going on in your life with us at hopechurchmemphis.com slash prayer. And subscribe to the Hope Church Memphis YouTube channel to experience previous worship services and more. Have a great week.